Hi there, welcome, welcome to Homekeepers. So glad to be with you today. So glad you are there and that we have this way to connect uh, for so many, many wonderful reasons. Uh, bringing you great Christian guests from literally all over the world and with different kinds of ministries. And what could be a greater privilege than that? And boy, do we have one for you today. I'm so pleased just a few minutes ago, I met Valerie Elliott Shepherd. A lot of you viewers are very well aware of the story of Jim and Elizabeth Elliott, great missionaries to Ecuador. And Jim, at a very, very young age, was speared to death by the Aka Indians as he was trying to make friends with them so he could tell them about Jesus. And uh, Valerie is the only daughter that they had. She was about 10 months old uh, when he died. And yet, I think she might know him better than most young people who maybe lost their father. And in a lot of ways, that's what this book is about. This is her book titled Devotedly. And let me tell you, as one who reads a lot of books, this one is in a category all by itself because I think almost miraculously, letters and journals were preserved after all these years. And she has put them together to give you a story of their love relationship, their marriage, and more than that, when you pick this up, you'll recognize a devotion to God that I'm not sure I've ever seen in my whole Christian life. So we welcome Valerie Elliott Shepherd to the program. And I'm going to join Stephanie for one of those good, you know, put together in one bowl meal, like creamy lemon chicken pasta. If you watch this program very often, you know, anything with lemon, we do it. So uh, I'm going to go watch her put it together. That's usually what I do. Uh, but before I do that, let me remind you, we are viewer supported. And uh, that means that through your offerings and when you order products we have, that's what keeps us on the air. And you can write a check the old fashioned way like I do it by writing to uh, Homekeepers Box 6922 Clearwater, Florida 33758 or uh, you can call the 800 number, 1-800-229-0059. And uh, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. We appreciate you so much. And I've joined a girl here now who doesn't write checks. <laughs> uh, one, I think one, one a month. <clears throat> one a month. To the water company because they charge online to pay your bill online and I'm not paying that. So I'll write a check they and mail charge? it. They charge? $2.75. I'm not paying $2.75 to pay a bill. So that's the one check I write a month. Okay, I th yeah, yeah, no. I understand, and I I don't blame you. Not money out the window. No, 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 no. Okay, uh, you are cooking up some chicken so breast. So this is chicken breast, just under a pound of chick chicken breast that we put um, in some oil. So we're just cooking that up. And you I know, have. we know you ladies are really busy, and that's why we try to find these one pot meals. This is one is super simple, and I, it's so gonna good. Be so it's tasty. gonna be so I good. Just know it. Okay. Okay. So I have a half a cup of fresh squeezed lemon juice. Lemon juice. juice. And we also grated the lemon before we juiced mm -hmm. it. Okay. So that's for we'll a little that. bit later. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to put lemon juice in here. I have four ounces of cream cheese I'm going to put in here. And now we've cooked the peas already because you're supposed to boil it in the, um, and she may have done that, but they're, they are cooked. Okay. But we cooked up. Sometimes. To, to make it simple, when, time. when you cook the linguine at the very end, you just throw the frozen peas mm -hmm. in, and then mm -hmm. that will take care of those. So I'm going to crank this up. We're going to cook this up a Please little bit. Please give it a little color. Yes. I'm We're always. And this just goes on the top, right? This parsley? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so I'm just melting down the cream cheese. I've cranked this up, mm -hmm. cranked it up. I have some um, of the liquid from the linguine left over. I have some Parmesan cheese and then two tablespoons mm -hmm. of the lemon zest. Yes, and uh, oh, there's nothing like it. Nothing. Really. It's the freshness. Just, yes. So good. Something clean about it. Also, last night I saw you with your gym clothes on. Yes, I went to, go. to the gym. Did you get a going, good workout? Mm -hmm, I've been going twice a week, doctor mm -hmm. ordered. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going very well. Yeah. I and. I'd like to say, you know, people say, oh, you get addicted to working out. <laughs> not I'm yet. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> I go begrudgingly every Tuesday and Thursday. And I'm a great-grandmother. I work out anyway. every night at home. 
But you will. You, you grow. <laughs> you'll, you'll learn. Can I tell the funny, um, the funny um, crunch story real quick since I'm waiting oh, for yeah. So we have a floor director, Brooke. She's 27. And they've met Brooke. She's the greatest seven. person in the world. 27 right years old. She comes in. She's like, oh, my gosh, I went to the gym last night. And they made me do 100 crunches. And oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. And Arthleen's <laughs> like, um, I do 125 every single night. Did you really have a problem with it? So made us feel like she could be my grandchild. <laughs> So she doesn't complain about it anymore, right. around our spleen at least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, it pays dividends. It pays, I mean, come on. I'm not going to say our age, but if I look half this good, half this good, I will be happy right oh, now. I'm not afraid of my age. I'll be 85 next December. Yes, okay, she okay. said it. This okay, so I have um, Parmesan, I have lemon zest. Let's put yeah. the lemon zest in. I've cranked this up really hot and now, okay, that was, I love that story. And I know yeah, Brooke that would, was a fun story. Brick wouldn't mind if I told no. it. Because it's funny. Maybe she can do 100 now without passing out. Maybe without whatever. passing out. And there's Rippy like, 125. Whee! <laughs> no. <laughs> I could go further, but I'm just lazy. Okay, now we're done. Okay. Okay, no. <laughs> okay I'm going to put some of like, uh, I'm going to go ahead and mix it up in here okay. real quick. Because we have a great guest to get we to. I do. Yes. And we already cooked the linguine, obviously. Mm-hmm. This is a great one. Um, and Stephanie I'm is so good to the tell and the gals apartment. how they can prepare ahead of time. Yes. This is a simple one. You could have that chicken already made. Mm -hmm. You could have a rotisserie chicken, and you don't even have to make it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so here right. you go. Okay, ready? Just a little bit. Yep, just a little bit. Well, this is not the, the best um, there we go. serving utensil for this. I don't need to taste it. I know there I'll love go. it, but oh, I will. Oh, wait. Oh, Make yeah. Make it pretty. Okay, there you go. <laughs> uh, I think that you ladies at home could do it with a little more finesse, but let's see I'm if I can. rushing. Mm-hmm. Mmm. Boy, that lemon. It smells so, it smells so I fresh. I thought that was quite a bit of lemon. Boy, that gives it a kick. It, it it's, it's fresh, right? It wonderful. It's good. awesome. Yeah. It's called creamy lemon chicken pasta. My mother taught me not to talk with food in my mouth. Um, but it's free. Recipe information coming up on your screen. And then I want you to meet my very special guest today. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. Well, I want to welcome you, Valerie. Elliot Shepard, it's it's an honor to have you, and I thank you. I think of your mother. I've heard her on other occasions, and she went to heaven what three or four years ago? 2015, June. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, your story was uh, through Gates of Splendor. Was was there a movie made out of that? Yes. And then there was one later, wasn't there? Yes. The mm -hmm. tip of the spear. So my mother did a documentary called Through Gates of Splendor. It's only 38 minutes long. Then there was a movie made called End of the Spear, and it's Steve Saint's story about his dad and his reconciliation with the Indians. And then there was also a documentary that he made, which is longer, called Beyond the Gates. I was thinking about this. Only heaven will reveal the fruit mm -hmm. that has come from mm -hmm. those men right. being cut down so young in life. It's, right. Mm -hmm. uh, God's ways are not our ways, are they? Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, my sister, who lives in Boca Raton, one of the greatest people in the world, she said she said, tell you she loves this. Uh, I told good. her about it, and she's a great reader, and she got it right away, and she's, mm -hmm. she called it masterful. Oh, uh, yes. Now, this, this is your parents' love story. Yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, featuring your dad also, who you never met, but you must have really uh, had a sense of knowing him Mm. In his writings? In his writings, sure. Of course, I met him as a baby, and uh -huh. I have a few sweet pictures of him and me. Um, I know that he was a full of fun man, full of adventure, but also very serious about the Lord, and he kept a journal from the time he was 
I think, a junior in college until almost when he died. I was inspired at the age of 14 when I really understood what it meant to follow Christ, to start a journal. So basically over all these years, I've not kept a daily journal, but write down my prayers. And so my father was amazing. And through his writings, as well as my mother's writings, as well as hearing my mother speak about him, I feel like I know him. I know. And I think there's, <coughs> I think that father-daughter bond is one of the strongest mm -hmm. in the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They say a son is a son until he takes a wife, but mm -hmm. a daughter's a daughter all, all of her life. All of her life. And mm -hmm. so when you meet him, it's going to be awesome, isn't it? It'll be. Uh, yeah. I feel like I know him too because I went online and listened to mm -hmm. some of the things he had to say. Mm -hmm. And first of all, I would say uh, the, the miracle, I believe, of having these journals and letters uh, survive all these decades. Yes, yes. And then I tried to wrap my brain around how you did it. I visualized, <laughs> <laughs> did you have them on the floor? And say, okay, this is this date and this is this date. This is a journal. This is a letter. It was very challenging for me. Um, of course, on a computer, you can keep things a little more in order, except that I wasn't good at it. So I had a friend who was always helping me find one particular line from a letter or finding, but they were all kept in order by my mother, first of all. So she gave me all of my, mo my father's letters in the 1980s when I had a bunch of children at home. And she said, you don't have time to read these now, but someday you'll want to. So in about 2011, 2012, I began to look for them, found them in the bottom of a memorabilia trunk, and was thrilled to find them because I really hadn't read them before. So I began to read them. Then I knew that my mother had also given me her journals and diaries from the same years, 1947 through 1956, she had given me. So I thought Great it would history. be good to put a book together. But my mother had told me all the letters were destroyed, her letters to him. Well, she was a brilliant woman, and the more I read my father's letters, which are also brilliant, mm -hmm. I began to think, how in the world am I going to put a book together? Hopefully, her journal entries will help enough. But then in 2016, I was in her attic looking through things, found the trunk from Ecuador, and we took each, I had a friend with me, and we took each thing out of the trunk. There were artifacts from the Indians. And then at the very bottom was a neat little packet of letters wrapped up with a blue ribbon, which is a traditional thing to do with love, love letters. And they said, Mr. Jim Elliott, Wheaton or Portland, five years worth of letters. <clears throat> you know, I wonder if that's just <clears throat> a lost art. Almost. We text everything. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I remember the last person that I know of to talk about letters mm -hmm. was Nancy Reagan, President mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Reagan's wife, yes. and he had always written to her. Yes. And yes. she kept them. And I just wonder if these younger generations uh, could comprehend. I just heard of a young couple recently in their early 20s who are writing to each other real letters instead of just texting. So at least it's, <laughs> it is sort of a lost art, but at mm -hmm. least a few people are doing I, it. I do think it's somewhat miraculous that all these were um, really preserved. Yes, yes. And with the dates on them, so you, you yes. can put them together. Um, your book, uh, devotedly, it caught my attention because this is your mother's handwriting, right. correct? Yes. But the three cent stamp. Yes. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember yeah. when you could get a three cent long, stamp. Long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. Now, they had a five year courtship, right? Yes. And as I read through it, I, I kept wanting to say, okay, let's. Let's get to it here. Let's get to it. <laughs> exactly. But it's amazing to me that two people could wait on the Lord mm -hmm. the way they did. That that was prominent in their lives. Yes. That, that was yes. number one. And I think because they didn't see each other except for five times in five years, that helped because the letter writing, of course, kept the love going and getting stronger. But when they saw each other those five times, there was only one visit that was more than a week long. Actually, it's two. There were two visits. One was 10 days, and then there was a two-week visit, about two different years. So they kept, from
from the very beginning, I don't know if you remember this part of the story, but in, at Wheaton, my mother was about to graduate, they were sitting in a cemetery together on a stone slab, and my father told her that he loved her, and he told her that he was pretty sure God had, uh, is guiding, was guiding him to be a single missionary. Mm -hmm. So he said, I don't know that I could ever promise to marry you or will know that I'm going to marry you. That was pretty hard news for my mother to hear, and my mother being very strong on the way she was raised, the father, her father taught the four brothers that they should never tell a woman that they love her unless they're ready to marry her, mm -hmm. unless they're ready to next say, will you marry me? And so this is what my father did. He tells her that he loves her, but then he says, I'm not sure we'll ever be able to. <laughs> so it was quite difficult. So my mother actually suggested that they pray through the summer and not write. And while they're sitting there, the moon rose and, the, and a cross on a tombstone, the shadow of it landed right between them. And they were sitting in silence for a while, realizing that Christ was first. They had to die to their feelings. My mother had not yet said and it took a very long time before she said to him that she loved him, even though she felt it. Mm -hmm. um, but that cross meant they had to live for Christ alone, even though they had obviously fallen in love. Yes, so as, I, as I mentioned at the top of the program, I've never read any book anywhere by anyone, maybe except some of the martyrs in the Bible, mm -hmm. <laughs> of the absolute devotion. Yes to yes. the Lord Jesus Christ by yes. both of them. Yes, uh-huh. And yet your dad, <coughs> he seemed to me like a fun guy. <laughs> yes, yes, he was lots of fun. He was sometimes the campus clown, but he was also very much a spiritual leader and felt it mm -hmm. his responsibility to exhort everyone, especially against dating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then in the spring, Practice what you preach, and I then in the spring <coughs> of my mother's senior year, he asks her to go to the Moody Bible Institute evangelism, uh, oh, it's a mission, mission conference. That was their first date. But they really didn't go out to dinner. They didn't have, he didn't have any extra money. Um, they walked, they took walks, and they met each other for studies. And within three months, they were definitely in love. But yeah, they... They, they truly waited on the Lord. They waited on His they time. They truly did. Mm -hmm. uh, this will <clears throat> make some people remember uh, exactly what we're talking about. Your dad is so well known mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. um, quote. Mm -hmm. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he could not lose. And that really was the way he lived. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was 110% missionary. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Um, you were born in Ecuador? Yes, I was born in a doctor's jungle home. And they expected a little boy. But when I came out, of course, it was a surprise, and my father right away said her name is Valerie. They had, they had chosen that one name if it was a girl, but they were quite sure they were going to have a boy. Mm -hmm. All of their friends, including Mary Lou McCulley, my mother's sister, my mother's brother, and one of the other missionaries had all had boys in the last year, so they were sure they were going to have a boy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would uh, probably give them reason to yeah, expect yeah. a boy. Yeah. How well do you remember those days? in Ecuador. If you left when you were eight or so, you probably have a good memory of it. I have good memories of the environment and the, and the Indians. I don't have specific events, stories that I could tell except for one or two. I loved the jungle, completely happy, completely free. When we lived with the Quechua Indians before we went to move in with the Aucas, which are now called the Wyodani. The Quechua's called me Butterfly, and so my Indian name was Pili Pinto, which meant butterfly because I was always flitting from one thing to another and just full of just having fun. So I remember having fun, jumping in the river, swimming every day, and I remember running through the forest. Um, Unlike children today who are bound to technology and... Yes, yes, I uh, had no TV. We've got kids having nervous breakdowns. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you live in the thatched hut? We, okay. We I first, know there was a house later yes. on. Well, we first lived in the house that my father had built for the, for the two of them, and that was a pretty well-built house, which lasted 40 years because we went there 40 years later and Very it was good. still standing. But we did live in a bamboo thatched house with the two Indian women that came out of the Alka tribe 
fleeing the violence that was happening with the Alcas. They came, arrived at a Quechua house, which was thatched roof, bamboo walls, and my mother decided to invite them to live with us. So we actually moved into a thatched roof house, which was on the same area property where my, the big house was. And didn't matter to me, I was perfectly happy wherever. Um, and of course my mother was a very loving, wonderful, good mother. She expected me to obey. She expected me to come in when I, she called me for meals, and of course I was always hungry, but I was let free to go and play until I started school. So when we moved to live with the Alcas because of those two women inviting us, we moved into a little hut with no walls, thatched roof, mud floor. My mother slept in a hammock and I slept on a bamboo bed right by her. And we lived in that for almost a year. And then my mother decided because the Alcas were always looking at everything and prying and talking about what we were doing, she said, we needed a little more privacy, especially since she was trying to I teach think me. So. <laughs> she wanted to teach me school, and uh, if they were interrupting all the time, you know, they didn't understand school schedule at all. So now the Alcas were the ones who killed yes, the your Alcas. father and the other missionaries. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, and you and your mother went to live with them. Yes, that happened when I was three and a half. When I was a little under <clears throat> three, these two women had fled the tribe and just arrived at a Quechua house, probably a three-day walk for them. The Quechuas came and told my mother, the Alcas have come, probably the men are hiding in the trees, they're probably going to kill us all. My mother was thrilled because she had prayed for the Alcas with my father from the time they were in college through their first four years down there in, in Ecuador. And she went to meet them with her tape recorder and her notebook and she started listening to everything they were saying and it was a very different language from Quechua. But then she decided, after spending one night with them, she decided they don't have anything to do or w any place to go, I might as well invite them to come live with us and that's why we moved into a thatched roof house. And so when I was, we think it was six to eight months, they actually lived with us and they didn't do anything as far as I know. They just sat around and talked. Well, were there and any around that had killed the missionaries? No. Any of the men that you... No, that the you different missionaries were in different jungle stations. Um, but anyway, th that's how we got invited back, because the women said, you know about God through another Alka named Ayuma, who came and interpreted for my mother and Rachel Saint. And, and she uh, did some translation of yes. the New Testament as well. Yeah. If you've just mm -hmm. joined me, I'm talking to uh, <laughs> Valerie Elliott Shepherd. She is the daughter of uh, Jim Elliott and uh, Elizabeth Elliott, uh, well-known well missionaries, uh, legendary. We're talking about the book Devotedly. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's, it's unlike any book you would ever read, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it holds your interest for sure because Valerie has taken letters and journals that were decades old and mm -hmm. organized them and then um, your comments kind of bridge it all together. Yes. Um, I'd say you're a very good writer, oh, by the thank way. You. Very thank you. Thank you. I had lots of help. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> uh, and we have the website on the screen. You can get the uh, information there. Is it on Amazon and all yes, those it is places? Also. It's also at Barnes Name is and Devotedly, Noble. just one word. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. I really think it will affect your relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I really, mm -hmm. truly believe that. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to talk about you a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, your mother had one child and you had eight. <laughs> yes, yes. I wanted uh, to have 10 or 12. Oh, did you? But my husband said no more after eight. <laughs> uh, you, did you do missionary work with your husband as well? Yes, for just three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went to the Congo. Mm -hmm. And are you, are you in the pastorate now? My husband has been a pastor for 43 years and he just retired last August. So we've been in six different churches. Yeah. And you homeschooled eight children? Yes, I didn't homeschool them all the way through high school, but for many of their years uh, they were mm -hmm. at home, yes. I'll tell you on this program, we love homeschool moms. Uh -huh. I, I figure them. with homekeepers you should. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love them. Uh, there's something about them. Uh, the kids are kind of special that mm. come out of the homeschool. Yes. Um, was there anything special that grabbed your attention ab about your father that mm. uh, I can only imagine the longing that yes, you would have. Yes, longing to know him. 
he, he said some amazing things, not only in his letters to my mother, but also in his journals. And he, there's one page in, in his journals that said he, was, he wanted to live by these three maxims for his life. And when I read those in his journals, I thought, well, I should certainly have those maxims also. And the first one is determination, not desire, determines destiny. I realized about myself that I'd always had lots of desires and wants and wishes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I wasn't always determined to follow through and make them happen. So if you're determined to follow the will of God, mm -hmm. He will lead you as long as you are seeking to be obedient mm -hmm. and read His Word. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the maxims. I'm not sure I can remember each one, but the other two had to do with your time. And I don't want to... Well, that... Boy, that gave you a lot of food for thought, didn't it? Yes, yes. I, I was mm -hmm. thinking I'd, I'd like to just be hanging out in heaven when you uh, meet him. <laughs> I know. I would love to <laughs> meet him. see what that's like. Now, uh, we only have a couple minutes left, but yes. uh, in this book, your parents were very different, weren't yes, they? Yes, yes. I think I have more of my father's personality because I'm more spontaneous. My mother was very regimented and had a psychological test one time and she rem she I remember her laughing about it. She says, I'm rigid <laughs> and there's no way to change me at all. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> would consider me rigid. So people thought of her as quite intimidating because she followed the letter of the law. But I grew up wanting to be good and wanting to please her. And so in my 30s, my husband and I had a sort of about face and understanding what the grace of God meant mm -hmm. because I'd been trying to be such a good mother and such a good minister's mm -hmm. wife and finally realized it's not about how I do it. It's, it's putting Christ yeah. in front of people as we live and show love. So when I said that to her, I said, Mom, it's, it's about God's grace and what, what Christ did for us. She said, and I think I need more of that grace when I speak. She said, I talk all about obedience and discipline, but she said, I need to tell That's people about rich. that grace. <laughs> that is rich. Yeah, we are out of time. Yes. Okay. Let me remind you again, though, get this book. It's called Devotedly, and uh, the author is uh, Valerie Elliott Shepherd, uh, daughter of legendary missionaries, and I, I feel it's a real honor to have her in the studio today and to begin to talk and just talk about something so good, so rich, Kingdom of God. Please join me next time. Remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Mm -hmm. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN programs and then on homekeepers.